You're watching BBC Two, and now the last in the current series of programmes in which Harriet Crawley advises you to join her collecting now. Hello again, and welcome to, sadly, the last programme in our present series. Well, we've had a lot of fun this end, and we're delighted to see from your letters that you've enjoyed our programmes too. We'll be answering some of your questions later on. But for this evening, Gwyn, Penny and I have been collecting for Under a Fiver. Also tonight, we'll be looking at a strange collection of architecture from demolition sites. But first, what looked like autumn leaves, in fact, were a clever and rather insidious kind of propaganda dropped by air during the war. This oak leaf reminded the Germans that their final victory has not happened. It's one of billions of leaflets dropped by both sides and now part of a vast collection built up by Reginald Auckland. Penny Juna went out and tells the story. Wars of words are nothing new, but bombing your enemy with bits of paper? The airmen may have thought it mad at the time, but as Reginald Auckland's vast collection testifies, aerial propaganda was to prove its effect on enemy morale. The story is a bizarre series of statements of the psychology of war. Leaflet dropping may have begun in the siege of Paris in 1870, but it was in World War I that it got going in earnest. The Germans started it, but the British reply was overwhelming. We went for overkill, flooding Europe with French and German language leaflets, 26 million by balloon alone. Paper cargoes were carried again in World War II, leaving as litter a remarkable record of military psychology. Not all the leaflets may have found their target quite as conveniently as this. In 1939, plain leaves fell in Moselle. Autumn, the leaves fall, we will fall with them. Here was a potent German poetry to poison the French against the English. More tasteful than this jigsaw, dropped in pieces to ridicule the Jews and the blonde English. Her copy of the Times is mirrored as Semit. The German sense of humor was relentless. A whole range of leaflets dropped over Italy mocked Allied threats of invasion, before and after. But they never understood the British national resilience. V1s dropped tons of waste paper, which were as laughable then as they are now. Some were raffled, others met a different fate. Hitler makes a contribution to our waste paper campaign by giving us our first leaflet raid. Someone has apparently misled him into believing that we hadn't heard about his last Reichstag speech, whereas we all heard it broadcast and read it in our papers. However, there are no complaints. We can do with all the paper we can get, even though it is made in Germany. There are various uses to which Hitler's leaflets may be put. For example, shaving paper. What of the troops? Well, the Germans asked the French where us Tommies were. They could hold the card up to the light to find out. Soft porn was another major weapon. What's your girl doing back home? Having fun with another man, that's what. But a bigger favourite with the Germans was the magazine Pin-Up, with the chillingly gothic reverse. This was an image they repeated almost as often as their claim that Americans back home profiteered while the hapless soldiers died. But if you didn't want to die, the Germans showed you how to fake illness, a ruse the British had tried first. Surely some of this mud must have stuck. But it seems that little of it did, whereas the Allies aimed better at the German nerve. Artillery often sent short-range showers onto German troops. 
part of a perpetual rain over most of Europe. Between D and VE Day alone, we dropped 500 million leaflets. Sometimes occupied towns were warned of forthcoming Allied liberation, which prompted suitable shows of relief. But the main Allied targets were German civilians, flooded en masse. The French chipped in with a treacherous jibe in which Stalin outsmarts Hitler, winning Poland and abandoning Hitler to his own bloodbath. This joke was doubly telling as it parodied an earlier German leaflet in which the English left the French to drown. The British imagination exceeded any sense of fair play. You name it, we'd forge it and flood the German market. Precision was essential, and usually we got it right. This yellow clothing card was printed perfectly, but the Kantanad stamp should be spelt Kantenad, so the whole forgery was useless. All sides forged money. Which pound note is real? Turn over, one has a propaganda message. A good way to get it read. And from then after the war, wherever there's been conflict, leaflets have been dropped. Right through Korea, to the Cyprus revolt, to the rebellion in Algeria. And even during Suez, we poked fun at NASA. And then, of course, Vietnam. Biggest and best, as always, the Americans dropped nearly 50 million billion leaflets. The Vietnamese used them to wrap food, to plug the walls, anything. But they probably had some effect on enemy morale as well. The Viet Cong were tired, away from home, and constantly facing death. Meanwhile in Taiwan, a ritual struggle with Red China has never ended. Both sides sublimate war by attacking with flags and leaflets, but no weapons. A paper flower falls into China, proclaiming down with communism. While for sheer beauty and grace, a real magnolia leaf carries a Taiwanese slogan. Here is an apogee in the art of soft cell, one of the gems of Reginald Auckland's collection. And aerial propaganda, once simply an aid to armed conflict, here at least has replaced it. If only this were to be its future. If you want to find out more, Reginald Auckland edits The Falling Leaf. This is a journal on the Society of Psychological Warfare Collectors. There's also an exhibition on the subject at the Imperial War Museum until January 17th. Well, we thought it would be fun in this, our last programme, to see what we could collect. After all, many of the collections we've been looking at in this series have been far more expensive than any of us could afford. But what could we get for under five pounds? Well, Penny, Gwyn and I have been out to see Penny, how did you tackle it? Well, my children love these old rubber bricks that I used to have, which you can't buy anymore. Really old toys are obviously collectible, and of course my children think these are antique. But I thought that slightly newer toys might be worth collecting too. So with a couple of hours to spare, I went off to Taunton, a pretty county town on the river with a lot of good toy shops. These are no good, much too expensive for me, either old or new, and people have been collecting model trains for years. I wouldn't get much more than a set of points with my fiver, not even with a discount. I'm going next door. How much is that doggy in the window, I wonder? Perfect, a second-hand shop. I wonder how many really original collections started in a place like this, with a brand new kaleidoscope? These look a bit more like it, wonderful. children, you know. 
Most of them must be about 10 or 20 years old and have obviously seen some active service. But they're still surprisingly sturdy. Thank goodness. I stuck to toys that I thought might become collectible, but I did feel brutal leaving some behind. Still, I made my choice, and I've got myself, I mean my children, of course, some really terrific Christmas presents. <laughs> Second childhood. Whether I simply don't organise myself properly, I don't know, but I seem to have very little time to look for things I like. When I find myself with time to spare in Bath, perhaps, I might call in at a likely-looking antique shop or somewhere like the Great Western Antiques Market. Great fun, though I prefer to investigate junk shops or house sales for myself. But there's everything from China to smile please. Old photographs are my fancy. I'm really looking for character photographs and um, anything agricultural as well, early agricultural. Uh, agricultural Derek Cooper is a specialist in early cameras and what they took. Some in there. Oh, that's exactly what I want, but... E... No, it's £16.50. Mm. No, that's... I think... Probably that's in bit, here, that's a about bit too expensive. You've got to something a bit cheaper. Because mm. everything I want to spend is... five pounds. Oh, no trouble. Okay. I'll get that one out oh, of the way. Oh, this is a little bit better. Now, that's a perfect shot. Those are all Be from uh, Harris's of Khan, yes. Sausage makers, I suppose. Just what I'm looking for. Six pounds, just over the limit. That's nice. Oh, three pounds. That's a nice farmyard scene, look. I'd like mm. that one. I wonder where he gets these prices from. Scopes. Not too expensive, but a good selection. This is exactly what I like. Look at that beautiful family shot, isn't it, on the lawn? Yeah, but you're going from about sort of 1890-ish to yeah. what, 1860, 65? Yeah. But it's maybe 12 70. pounds anyway, yeah. mm. I'm afraid it's Thank just you. too expensive. Somebody's copy of... Mm. That's a nice. Right. That's also nice. That's... Oh, that's 150. Good. That's 450. Mm -hmm. What about something for about 50 pence? Well, there'll be stuff in there. There'll be some really bad stuff at about 20. <laughs> but who knows? Yes. Who knows? Oh, now, that's, that's, that's fine. I like that. Some kind of um, ladies' garment factory, I should think, isn't it? Oh, and that's 50 pence. Five exactly. pounds, exactly. Thank, Thank you very money. much, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Well, money doesn't go very far when you're searching for old photographs. But for what I collect, Five pounds is plenty. That is, if you don't count the airfare. T-shirts, and I collect them from all over the world to wear on the tennis court. I've got Texas for the service, Bahamas for the forehand, San Antonio for the backhand, and Bali for the volley. But my favorite the Great Wall of China is almost too precious to wear. But the one T-shirt I'm missing is London. So I went looking. The Tower of London was pretty, but plain. Buckingham Palace, very dull. Could this be more exciting? It's original, but rather out of date. And this, very corny. This one's a humorous t-shirt, but everybody's got one. And in London's West End, isn't there something a bit more snazzy? Well, it's just too obvious. Sadly, this one's too small. Where else can I look? T-shirts, T-shirts everywhere, and all for under a fiver. But the choice isn't inspiring. Now here's an idea. What a selection. Witty, even daring, but not that much on London. At last I found the one. And while he's doing that, I thought I'd just treat myself to one extra T-shirt, just for our programme. Good. Which one did you actually come away with, though, Harriet? Uh, this was the London one. What do you think of it, Greg? Well, I like it. I mean, I can imagine it looking fabulous in a nightclub in San Francisco, sir. Harriet, <laughs> what do you think? 
think it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was slightly disappointing because there wasn't that much choice as I think you saw in the film. But uh, Penny, we didn't see what you came away with. Well, I came away with the, the crane, which I couldn't resist. I regretted leaving the monkey most horribly. But this was really, I suppose, the most collectible thing which I got, the, um, a jigsaw puzzle. That is lovely. Wooden. What, you, I... what do you like about the early toys? Well, I, I, I think children just still play with them. They still enjoy the old toys. I mean, like these bricks. They really... Mm. I well, don't think we can improve upon them. If they're second-hand, at least you know that they've lasted well and they've given children a lot of happiness, Absolutely. I mean, like this other one, which I didn't uh, reveal. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, up your sticks in the hand up. <laughs> oh, God. Pistol packing mama. <laughs> Wait, what have you got in well, here? Well, I'll tell you about those in a moment. These are the sort of loose photographs that I bought in the shop, the kind of thing. There's a marvellous picture there of an old gypsy family. Um, I think that's why I like old photographs, because they give you a bit of a jolt. They take you back and make you realise what life was like. I love buying photographs which really have a theme or an identity. These are old photograph albums that I very much enjoy buying. And this one, actually, is from the family of a primitive Baptist missionary uh, in Stafford, of all places, just on the edge of Cannock Chase. And my favourite photograph of all is this one there. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a group shot of a family, a very proud father with a little daughter. And it could come straight out of H.G. Wells, couldn't it? Straight out of Kipps or the history of Mr. Polly, something like that. It's a and that's, I, I think it just gives you an insight into other people's lives, really, of long ago. Harriet, tell me why, it gives an insight into your life, why do you collect T-shirts? <laughs> well, uh, it's, you might think that all the T-shirts, you can get them all in London or in one city, but the point is actually that the reason I said the China one was the most precious is because this actual T-shirt you can only buy on a tourist shop outside the Great Wall itself or in Peking. Mm. So it actually means you've been there. And the same with, with Hong Kong. And, also, you see, it's quite fun. You've got the front on each one and the back, but they do mean you've actually been to the place. And, of course, the people who buy the London T-shirts might think they're wonderful, just because you live in London. That's you right. don't think they're Well, superb. that's the other trick to T-shirts is it's a sort of golden rule. Never wear London in, in London. Wear it in mm. China. <laughs> well, that's... Just a moment, Harriet. Look, before you go any further, you can tell people about the next item in the programme in a moment. There's a little present here for us. For you, for you, from us all, from Can Penny, I open it? from me. Open it for goodness sake. From the whole production team of uh, Collecting Now. And since you really didn't uh, like the T-shirts in London, beautiful. we thought we'd give you a really that nice. That is fantastic. Thank you very <laughs> much. Shot are you going to use that one for? I will have to save that for the smash, and I usually yes. miss, but for the ones ones that I can hit, that's you a beautiful be a one. Thank you so much. Game set and match. It really was. That's a real surprise. <laughs> you, be, you better go on with the next item. <laughs> Yes, I'm so um, thrown by this now. Many of you have written to us about your collections, which we hope to feature in our next series. But Charles Brooking of Guildford told us about one collection that we found so enticing, we had to go and see it straight away. As another Victorian terrace comes crashing down, Charles Brooking emerges with a dusty mixture of household treasures to add to his valuable collection. Door knockers, cistern brackets, plaster mouldings, and pieces of sash window. So often lost, destroyed by the bulldozers, these items have always held a curious fascination for him. Well, it all started with these um, 1930s Bakelite numerals when I was about three years old. I found a gatepost in the garden with some screwed on it, being removed by the previous owner. Became interested in um, numerals and other fittings. And by the time I was about six or seven, I'd built up quite a collection of ironmongery, and I'd by that time spread into Victorian ironmongery. And I soon started visiting demolition sites, trying to find similar things. In no time, I'd started collecting Victorian tiles, parts of fireplaces, window joinery, particular sash windows, and things like that, and I became interested in their construction. I suppose about four years later, I'd started the idea of a museum, my father bought me a shed to store the stuff in, not realising where this is going to lead. All the common currency and everyday artefacts of a vanished society. Art Nouveau, Georgian and the more florid Victoriana. 
Charles doesn't merely rescue these features for his own satisfaction. They record the rapid progress of design and technology, from early Georgian hob grates to these more efficient Victorian register grates. His collection has become a valuable source of reference for architects, designers and builders, and his ambition is to create a permanent architectural library. What you're seeing here is only about 2% of the collection, the rest being in storage either at the back of the garage or in the four sheds you can see behind the trees. Small details like sash pulleys, crucial in dating period buildings, and yet until recently, who would have bothered? Charles Brookings' singular crusade takes him all over the country, but these, his prized possessions, have all been salvaged from infamous London demolitions. The Firestone Building is a very important piece of Art Deco design. In the 1930s society were very keen to get it listed. Um, and was tragically demolished over August bank holiday in 1980 before it could be listed on the following Monday. I managed to salvage these interesting bits of decorative faience the following, about two weeks later, I think it was now, yes, by climbing over the rubble and extracting them, what remained from this bulldozed pile of rubbish. Um, these are parts of the Egyptian capitals, um, and these are parts of the column lower down, this being a section of the original entranceway. And that's the edge to the actual F of the Firestone, the central emblazoned motif the, over the main entrance. Fortunately, Lloyds were more sensitive when it came to the demolition of their important building in Leadenhall Street. They organised one of the first sales of architectural bric-a-brac. A door from the main corridor, decorative grills from the basement. Conservationists fought long and hard to save the magnificent Georgian Cutler Street warehouses. Charles Brooking is particularly proud of this cast-iron circular window, complete with shutters. Unity House has a place in our social history as well as architectural significance. In 1910, it became the first purpose-built trade union headquarters in the country. Charles found this lovely Art Nouveau wrought iron baluster from the main staircase of the building, and also a stylish piece of stained glass from one of the first floor office windows. Flaxman's house, home of the Victorian sculptor, is the most recent controversial demolition. Conservationists lost that battle earlier this year, and even worse, perhaps, Portland Place last year. Portland Place was designed as a whole by the Adam brothers, Robert and James Adam, in the 1770s, and was tragically demolished in 1980. Most of the features I rescued have been just destroyed, have not stepped in during demolition and rescued them from the jaws of the bulldozer, almost literally. This is a Caron hob grate designed by the Adam brothers um, for Caron from the basement of 49 Portland Place. This is one of the fine carved ram's heads from the main entrance of the building after it's been stripped of its layers of paint. And this is one before it was stripped down, showing the masses of paint on it. History has been saved, but now his own collection is threatened. I'm very cramped, and I'm trying to find decent premises to show the collection off properly to architects and historians interested. And I've been looking desperately for premises for the last five years without much success. I hope I find something shortly, because if I don't soon, the collection is going to become almost impossible to move in. Well, among your letters this week, we've had one from Mr Norris in Wiltshire. He owns a carbine which belonged to his grandfather, who used it on active service in South Africa in 1882. Mr Norris holds a firearm certificate, but he wants to know, can he pass the gun on to his son if he plugs up the breech and upper barrel, so the carbine could be called an antique and not a firearm? The answer is, I'm afraid, no. There's nothing you can do to a firearm which will alter its legal definition as a firearm. When your son is old enough, Mr Norris, he must apply for his own firearm certificate, but the police do have every right to refuse. Well, to answer more of your questions on restoration, here's John Fitzmaurice Mills. What are you going to tell us about today, John? It's that perennial one of the stopper in the decanter. And if you put heavy wines like dark sherry or Madeira or port in and the neck gets wet and then the stopper is put in once it's wet, you're going to get a very good stick indeed. Please, please resist the old one of getting another bit of glass and hopefully giving it a bit of a tap, because if you do, you're much more likely to break everything. I think probably the best solution is to get some glycerine from the chemist 
and then to very carefully put it in so that it goes in between the stopper and the neck like that and will eventually soak down. And you'll often find that after about three or four minutes that this may have done the trick. If it doesn't, submerge the whole decanter in warm, not hot water, leave it there for about an hour, try it again. If it's still obstinate, leave it overnight. And generally, the worst of them will come out like that. But if you've done what a friend of mine has done in London, Mandy O'Flynn, broken off the top of the stopper and the stump is left there, you are in a bit of trouble. So what I would do, Mandy, if I was you, is to put some methylated spirits with the glycerine and a little salt, and again, put it round the top there, and then get a hairdryer and very carefully play the warm air, revolving the canter as you do, onto the neck. And you should find that after about three or four minutes that that will do the trick and you'll be able to ease out or tap it out from underneath. If still sticking, put it in the water and leave it overnight. Well, I've been quite staggered by the amount of your letters that have come in and some very interesting queries indeed. And I do assure you that I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks or so going through them and getting the answers away to you. So please be patient. There's one here of interest, Mrs. De Helsby from Welling Garden City, Hertfordshire. And she asks in the first one that I did, what did I use for treating the woodworm holes so that they got some strength again? Ordinary size, you can get it from a decorator's, or from an ironmonger's, dissolve it in cold water, and then heat it up in a double saucepan, and having put your plasticine or clay round the piece to be treated, just pour it on. And quite a number of you have been querying, what on earth do I mean by oil of spike? Well, it's quite simply oil of lavender. And almost any chemist should be able to get it for you. Very good indeed for treating bloom on furniture and other surfaces like that. And be careful, I should only ask for about an ounce, because it's rather expensive and really almost a sheaf of what we do with old copper. Particularly items such as this kind of old cauldron or saucepan. Well, I think this is the result of excessive tarnish. It's tar and soot and perhaps some food spillage and the rest. So what do you do? I think probably the best is to get one of those descalers for kettles. But first of all, be very careful because they are corrosive, so I would certainly wear a rubber glove, even if you're going to use faucets with it. It's also very toxic, so plenty of ventilation. And then get a swab of cotton wool like this and sponge it over the area to be treated. It's not going to happen all at once. In fact, it may take perhaps half an hour. It may even need all night. But having done that, and when you come to the end of the period you've selected, You've then got to sluice off this rather unpleasant liquid and dry it. Well, I did a piece last night, because it takes an awful long time to get through, and here you can see where the metal is coming through. And you can then, of course, put an ordinary metal polish on and start to bring up the sheen of the metal underneath. And you can see, well, there is some copper coming through. But with this kind of getting rid of heavy tarnish, don't fall for the old housewives one of using those very corrosive powders that are used for cleaning lavatories. You may be all right with copper, but if you go and use it on brass, you're going to be in real trouble because it'll leach out the zinc. And instead of getting that lovely gold glitter of the brass, you're going to get a rather strange pinky coppery look. John, is it true that these lovely old copper pots and, and brass pots are rather valuable. Yes, they're coming up very considerably, and, and, a, and a fine preserving pan like this, I would think, be around about the hundred pound mark at least. And even a rather battered old specimen, once cleaned up, is going to be in the uh, 50 pounds, something like that. So they're collectible. Oh, very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you, John, very much. And this is the last opportunity to give you our address for John's leaflets or for letters. Collecting now, BBC, White Ladies Road, Bristol, BS8 2LR. Over the last 12 weeks, we've seen collections of Art Deco, clocks, pottery, corkscrews, even cowbells and Bakelite radios. Everything from the very expensive to the very cheap. It all goes to show everything is collectible. Before too long, we do hope to be back with another series and bring you more of the fun and fever of collecting now. Until then, from all of us on the programme, good night 